Um, so again, folks, for the movie, this is um, October 3rd, and this is lab. We're doing the first lab of Protis, Chapter 20, Unit 20. Um, there's two handouts, the Protis worksheet, which I'm going to suggest you use to kind of guide getting to know your um, Protis today. And we have um, prepared slides, so each team of four will need to check out a micro A box and a micro B box. And in addition, folks, on bench four, we will have the models that we're going to discuss. And in addition, we have um, live cultures of amoeba proteus, euglena, and paramecium. So what you might want to do just to be efficient is maybe one person per team of four um, does an amoeba wet mount, another one does the euglena wet mount, and a third one does a paramecium wet mount. Just as a heads up, you guys, very often the amoeba have died before we get them. So maybe just maybe take two or three minutes to scan your wet mount for amoeba. And if you don't find any, I would just move on, right? The euglena culture and the paramecium culture, you're going to love them. They're just gorgeous, and they're moving all over the place. Okay, so um, what I thought we would do is do a protist concept map. And I didn't include this, you guys, in any of your packets. So um, we'll just do it on the board. Um, and I'll try to take a movie of it, so we'll have that as a resource. And then furthermore, you guys, just with regard to business, so we will not we will not have an open lab this week. We will not have an open lab tomorrow, but we will have an open lab next Friday. That's the Friday before the lab exam, the lab practical, and it will be here from 9 to 11 a.m., right? And it's open to, to everybody, yeah, so folks in different lab sections are welcome to come. All right. So, folks, again, we're just going to um, dive in here to do our concept map on protists. And this is a concept map based on their lifestyle. You know, what ecological role do they play in nature? So we're first going to start, you guys, with our free-living um, protists. And do remember, you guys, protists, they're eukaryotes, but they're neither um, fungi nor plants nor animals, right? Um, so we're going to be talking mostly about animal-like protists, and what do we call animal-like protists? Protozoa, good. So most of these little guys are protozoa. Um, the free-living protists, folks, they live in water-rich habitats, so aquatic environments like ponds or rivers or streams, or in um, um, they can live in soil, but it has to be rich in water for them to be able to carry out their, their life processes. So, folks, the, um, the three free-living free protozoa we're going to take a look at are amoeba proteus. And amoeba proteus is an amoeba, um, which tells us it uses pseudopods for motility and for um, um, endocytosis, phagocytosis. And then we'll look at this beautiful euglena. And euglena are really cool, you guys. They have chloroplasts. Originally, they evolved as chemoheterotrophs. They were hunters. But then they engulfed uh, eukaryotic algae. And the algae became an endosymbiont and eventually evolved into chloroplasts. So euglena are called mixotrophs. In the light, they can carry out photosynthesis. So in light, they're photoautotrophs. But in the dark, they return to being chemoheterotrophs. They, be, they become hunters, so they're called mixotrophs. And then the third free-living um, protozoa we'll look at, folks, is called paramecium. This is a beautiful ciliate. And they're, they're in the wet mounts, you guys, they look like these big battleships kind of cruising through. They're huge, you know, relatively huge. If you were to mix the paramecium and euglena together, it looks like the euglena are these little green speedboats, you know, go all over, and the big paramecium, like, dah, 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 dah. so it's kind of fun if you mix them together. All right, so folks, it, um, to discuss these little guys, we do have models. So folks, it would be fair on our lab exam for us to show you a model or maybe a cartoon, a diagram of the protozoan, and then ask you to identify just the parts we're going to go over and their functions. Okay, so okay, what, what would you call the cytoplasmic extensions? Those are the pseudopods that literally means false feet, and they have two functions. One is for motility. It permits the um, amoeba to crawl over solid surfaces. And a second function, you guys, is the process called endocytosis, when the amoeba can bring large food particles, maybe even other microbes, into the cell and a membrane-bound um, food vacuole. So what will happen, the amoeba will attach to the food particle, 
and then the pseudopods will, um, will reach around and fuse, and that will form the food vacuole, and then the food vacuole or phagosome will be brought into the cytoplasm, where the food will then be digested. So you guys, if I ask you for two functions of the pseudopod, what would you tell me? Fertility and food acquisition, good. Endocytosis, phagocytosis, good job, you guys. Folks, this little um, oval structure, if I told you chromosomal DNA was inside, what's the name of this structure? The nucleus, okay. So our amoeba prokaryotes or eukaryotes? You, eukaryotes, good. Which domain? Domain eukaryote, awesome, you guys, well done. Okay. Another really neat structure, folks, that um, many, 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 many protozoa, if not all, have is this cool structure called the contractile vacuole. Now, remember that um, the amoeba is protozoa, they're animal-like, so do you think they have a cell wall? No, they don't, right? That's, a, that's an animal characteristic. Um, animal cells lack cell walls. Amoeba lack cell walls. But they're often living in hypoosmotic environments, right? So what would they be in danger from? What could kill them in that hypoosmotic environment? Remember what, what our bacteria face the same challenge? Osmotic lysis, right? So what's neat, you guys, is that the protozoa have evolved a different strategy to prevent osmotic lysis. They evolved these cool structures called contractile vacuoles. And what the contractile vacuoles do is they collect excess water from the cytoplasm. They fill up like a water balloon, and then they'll contract driving the water outside of the cell, pumping the water outside of the cell through a canal. So they're like a pump, like, like on a, a leaky boat, you know, you have a pump to pump the excess water out. That's what the contractile vacuole does. It's very cool. Okay, so we have the model, you guys. So you'd want to know the, the, um, the structures and functions. Um, we have the wet mount. And again, you guys, a lot of the amoeba, often they're dead. They're very fragile. So just spend a couple of minutes looking for the amoeba. I'll try to post on um, Canvas YouTubes of... Um, videos of living amoeba because they are gorgeous. And then you're going to be looking in your um, your micro boxes for prepared slides of amoeba. Some of you will have prepared slides where the company stained the amoeba different fluorescent colors, which I'm like, for a biology class, I like, I wish they hadn't done that because some people think they're fluorescent pink and turquoise and yellow in nature. They aren't. Those are just dyed. Okay. All right. So our wonderful, oh, who is this again, you guys? If I put this on the um, exam and I said this is a free living protozoa living in water, um, provide the, the scientific name, the genus, and specific epithet or species name, what would you tell me? Amoeba, Amoeba proteus. Awesome. Good job, folks. So we got that little guy. All right. So next, folks. Oh, this is such a cool protozoan. So the, the next one, folks, you're going to be looking at is called Euglena. And again, you have prepared slides in your micro boxes. We have living cultures, you guys, and they are alive. And they're in there, and they're just cruising around like little speedboats. Um, so Euglena, folks, are, as we mentioned, they're called mixotrophs. And this always confused me because it's like, why do we talk about them as protozoa when they have what? What do you think these green oval structures are? Chloroplasts. I'm like, why do you call them a proto protozoa, right, if they have chloroplasts? So in evolutionary history, they started out as chemoheterotrophs. They were hunters, just like the amoeba, just like the paramecium. But somewhere back in evolutionary history, they phagocytize an algal cell, right? And algae have chloroplasts, they have chlorophyll A, they carry out oxygenic photosynthesis. And this is wild, you guys. So um, the algal cells became endosymbionts. They weren't destroyed. They ended up living in the cytoplasm. Um, they replicated. When the euglena replicated, the algal endosymbionts got um, passed on to the descendants. So eventually, the algal endosymbionts, you guys, what did they evolve into? The chloroplasts, yeah? This is so cool. So when euglena is in the presence of light, what can they do? Which cool process? Oxygenic photosynthesis. So in light, they're photoautotrophs. But in the dark, they return to being hunters. In the dark, they're chemoheterotrophs again, right? And so an organism, you guys, that can switch between being a photoautotroph and chemoheterotroph, they call them mixotrophs, which I think is a really cool name. Okay? So, you guys, let's just go over a few of the structures here. So euglena are flagellates. This is a very poor model of a flagellum, right? And the way the flagella work 
and the Euglena folks, I, they actually bend over the body and they whip back and forth like this, drawing the Euglena through the water-rich environment. And they're actually kind of tumbling in space like this, right? If, if I tag this big structure, you guys, and said chromosomal DNA was inside, which structure is this? The nucleus, right? So to which domain do Euglena belong? Domain eukaryote, awesome folks, right? And if we tag the oval green structures, Chloroplast, what did they evolve from? From algae, right? And you guys, this is like the little nesting dolls. The algae acquired their chloroplasts from what? Cyanobacteria, right? So it's almost like a little nesting doll. I mean, okay, don't even worry about that, but I just think that's so cool. What's the function, you guys, of the chloroplasts? Oxygenic photosynthesis. Why are they green? Chlorophyll A, awesome, you guys. Now, folks, if you have the capacity to carry out photosynthesis, would it be helpful to detect light? Like if you're in a pond, right, would it help to, you know, to, you're moving, you're trying to find the right light. So would it be helpful to have a photo detection system, a light detection system? Would that be helpful? Yeah. And you guys, this is so cool. Part of the photo or light detection sy system in Elodea is this little red structure called a stigma or an eye spot. Either term is acceptable on the lab exam. So the stigma or the eye spot is part of the photo detection system. So the euglena will exhibit phototaxis. What's phototaxis? Movement along a light gradient, right? Chemotaxis was movement along a chemical concentration gradient. So phototaxis is what? Yeah, so movement along a light gradient. You got it. Right, awesome. And what, what's so fun with this, you guys, is in your wet mounts, right, your euglena are, are moving, swimming through space, and they're going like this. And if you're patient, maybe go on to, I'm going to say maybe high dry, you might see red, red, red. It's so exciting. It's really cool. Working with vet mounts are really cool. Okay, you guys, so we did, what was this again? Flagellum. We did nucleus, chloroplasts. Oh, do you think the euglena might need a contractile vacuole? Yeah, and what's the, what's the function of the contractile vacuole? Pump out excess water to prevent osmotic lysis. Awesome, you guys. Okay, and again, we've got um, living cultures here. So you guys definitely look at the euglena wet mount. You're going to love them. The third free-living protozoan folks we're going to do is um, paramecium. And usually the models lack the cilia, right? And I think it's because just it's really expensive for them to cover the whole surface with cilia, and they probably often break off. Um, the structure of eukaryotic cilia, it's similar to the structure of eukaryotic flagella, except usually cilia are shorter and more numerous. Right? Those of you that have had ANP, you know that eukaryotic um, flagella and cilia, they're covered by an extension of cytoplasmic membrane, and within them they have what's called a 9 plus 2 arrangement of microtubules. This is classic in eukaryotic flagella. So even though eukaryotic flagella and cilia, they serve a similar function as bacterial flagella, their structure is really different. Remember with the bacterial flagella, it's just naked protein, right? Uh, long filament of protein, and the bacterial flagellum rotates. In eukaryotes, the cilia and flagella, they whip back and forth, right? That's what pro provides the propulsive motion. Okay, so you guys, um, so we want to remember that the paramecium is covered in cilia, and so what's one function of cilia? Motility, good. And a second function, you guys, is this invagination here. It's called the oral groove. It's kind of like the equivalent of our mouth and throat, right, esophagus. So the oral groove is also covered in cilia, and they're going to beat to draw food particles, maybe other microbes down here. And which process do you think is going on right there, folks? That yeah, Good, phagocytosis, endocytosis, right? So the food is brought inside the cytoplasm in a membrane-bound va vacuole, a food vacuole or phagosome, and then it will be digested, yeah? But then after the food's digest digested, folks, will there potentially be waste left behind? Yeah, you have a waste vacuole, right? So to me, this is so cool, you guys. 
So the, the paramecium, they have a dedicated portion of the cell membrane that's a functional equivalent of our anus. And this is where what's happening to get rid of waste. What's the opposites of endocytosis? Exocytosis, right? I just think that's brilliant. They have a little tiny anus. Is okay. Adorable <laughs> little tiny things, huh? Okay. You guys, do you think the paramecium needs a contractile vacuole? Yes. Yeah. And this is nice, you guys. It shows more detail. So in this contractile vacuole, they're showing us the radiating canals. These are the canals that extend into the cytoplasm, and their job is to collect the excess water from the cytoplasm. They'll channel it to the contractile vacuole. It'll fill up like a water balloon and suddenly contract, um, pumping the water to the outside of the cell to prevent what? Osmotic lysis. Good job, you guys. Now, another really cool thing about ciliates is they have two nuclei. They have a great big nucleus called the macronucleus. Macro means big. And then they have a little tiny nucleus called the micronucleus. And folks, um, for us on the lab exam, if I ask you the function of the micronucleus, if you just tell me it's involved in sexual reproduction, that'll be fine, right? So paramecium, just like a lot of our fungi, they can reproduce both asexually by cytokinesis, mitosis and cytokinesis, but they can also combine genetic information between two different parents, right, in sexual reproduction. And again, that's, that's going to be one of the, um, the micronucleus will be involved in sexual reproduction. So pretty cool. Okay. And again, folks, we have um, live cultures of paramecium. They're much bigger than the euglena. Um, so again, it's really fun to kind of mix them together. And they tend to move more slowly than the euglena. I think of them as like great big battleships out there, right? And the euglena are the little speedboats, you know, zipping around. So this is good old. Oh, what's the genus name of this, folks? Paramecium, Paramecium right? Is it, um, which domain does it belong to? Good, awesome, folks, great. So I'll put these over here. I'll put the models, you guys, by their cultures. So we have the Guinea cultures in the middle, the Paramecium cultures are on the end. And you guys, we do have some um, slides and cover slips there for you and transfer pipettes. And then we have our amoeba. In addition, folks, this is really fun. We have some mystery pond water. So this pond water with the LOD, this is probably aquarium water. And then we have some real honest to goodness mystery pond water here. So yesterday, um, folks were making uh, wet mounts from the pond water, and there's all kinds of motile protists in it. It's really kind of fun. It's like going to the microbial zoo. It's really fun. Okay. All right, folks. So then what I'm going to do is actually combine um, Protus Lab 1 with Protus Lab 2. Protus Lab 1 was supposed to be just that, our introduction. But, folks, because that lab exam is sneaking up on us, my thought was, I, I'm going to push this. I'm going to give you um, most of the information for Protus Lab 2, which was going to be on symbiotic Protus. So you'll have the weekend to study it, right? And that way, next Tuesday, we'll just have a tiny bit to finish up with protists. And then Tuesday's lab and Thursday's lab, you could consider, consider it an open lab so that you can review for the lab exam. I think Dr. Holland, she offered that she'd put up um, samples or put up the, um, the microscopes, uh, the demo microscopes, kind of spread them out over the benches so that you'd have an opportunity to revisit the different units we've done. And then, of course, I'll be here hopefully to answer questions, okay? And maybe we can do just some practice quizzing, right? Okay. Okay, so you guys, so now we're going to go into the symbiotic um, protists and... Um, a couple of them will leave until next week because I don't have the, the demos ready, but we can get a lot, we can discuss a lot of them. And again, folks, um, for these um, symbiotic, fun, uh, symbiotic protists, um, you're going to have, for most of them, you'll have prepared slides in either the micro A or B box, and hopefully on your worksheet it will tell you which, is it the A or B box and which slide. And furthermore, you guys, for... Um, for most of the symbiotic protists, I'll, I have demo scope set up over on bench four. Okay, all right, folks. So, so we just talked about free living um, protozoa, most of protozoa. So now let's talk about symbiotic protozoa. So all of these are going to be our animal-like um, protists or protozoa. 
And you guys help me out. Um, what do we call symbiosis in which both partners win? So win-win symbiosis is called? Good, yeah, mutualism. And folks, um, Tuesday I'll have a, um, a sample, um, a live sample of the protozoan called Trichonympha. And this is a mutualistic um, symbiont with termites. And what's really uh, awesome, what do you think of termites, you guys? What do you, what do you think of termites doing to your wooden house? They eat it, right? But you guys, termites are animals, right? Just like we are. So do termites, um, can termites all by themselves make cellulase to digest the cellulose in um, plant cell walls like in wood? Nope. So guess who makes cellulase? The trichonympha. Isn't that amazing? So the trichonympha live in the termite intestines, and they're making the cellulase that helps digest, hydrolyze the, the polymers of glucose, beta-glucose, of the cellulose in the, the plant cell walls. So um, they're helping to feed the termites. The termites are providing warmth and moisture and are providing the food, right, for the trichonympha. So it's really cool. And we'll see you guys on, on Tuesday. What we usually do, we usually do, I, I hope we have some termites. Um, is that we usually kill a termite quickly so it doesn't suffer, and then we pull its intestines out, and then we make a wet mount of it. We squash them, and it releases all the, the protists in their intestines. And these trichonymphia guys, they're, they're covered in flagella, um, and actually some ectosymbiotic bacteria on their surface, and so they're beating their flagella, and the little bacterial spirochetes are beating, so they're, they're really pretty cool. But that will be Tuesday. And you guys, this will be a bonus topic on the lab exam. So if I ask you about trichonympha, it'll be a bonus topic. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, and I know a lot of you, your lives are really busy and you are getting totally stressed out, just forget the bonus stuff, right? Just don't even worry about it. Okay, and then folks, um, if it's wind neutral, what do we have? Commensalism. And right now, you guys, I don't have any commensal um, protozoa. They're out there. I just don't have any specific examples for you. Right? So what do we call it when we have symbiosis and one partner wins and the other partner loses or is harmed? Parasit yeah, parasitism. So that's where, where we're going to spend most of our time is looking at um, pathogenic parasitic protozoa that invade another organism and cause harm. Okay. So with parasitism. So my thought was, folks, is healthcare professionals and just, you know, as a member of the public, it's important for you to know how do we get in infected with these parasitic protozoa. This is really important here in California, and it's also really important if you go traveling, because there's some parts of the world that have certain parasitic protozoa that we lack, right? So it, it's important you know how you would get infected, so you can take steps to try to um, prevent infection. Yeah, it doesn't. Oh, trichonymphia, it's mutualism. Okay. Did I spell it right, you guys? Yeah. M-U-T-U-A-L-I-S-M. That's symbiosis in which both partners benefit. Win-win. Yeah, the best kind, right? I wish we could all be mutualists, right? Okay. So, okay, so what I thought, since transmission is really important for, you know, protecting our own health, health of our family and friends, and certainly as healthcare providers, it's important you know how your patients are getting infected. I thought we'd split our parasitic protozoa into... Um, three groups based on transmission. So um, the, the first type of transmission, you guys, again, I'm going to leave it until next Tuesday because I, I don't have the demo set up yet. So we'll just, um, this will be another bonus. So this is going to be sexual transmission. And the reason it's sexual, you guys, is this um, protozoal pathogen, it lives on the mucous membranes of the genitals, right? The, so that's why it's sexual transmission. And again, folks, this would be bonus. And I'll have a demo set up next week. This is the flagellated protozoan called trichomonas. And maybe you've heard, folks, people talking about trick, trick. 
yeah, this is this is um, trichomonas, and again, it's a flagellate, and it this is another great example, folks, that if you are working, say, in a health clinic, it's it would be so powerful if you if you had a microscope maybe and could do some smears and stains, because if a woman presents right with maybe kind of a maybe odorous discharge, um, and maybe she's sexually active, and maybe hasn't been practicing safe sex. You can just do a vaginal swab and make a smear and stain it. And the trichomonas, they're huge. You'll be able to diagnose it right off the bat, just five minutes in your office. Um, I, I think it is really unfortunate that in modern medicine, all of your samples get sent off to a diagnostic lab, and then you have to wait at least a day or two, you know, to get the results back. You can do a lot of powerful, um, start the differential diagnosis just in being able to do wet smears or stains in your, in your, um, in your clinic, right? So anyway, that's just me. I'm like, you know, it's too bad that we aren't doing more of this hands-on stuff because it can really speed up diagnosis. Okay, so you guys, again, we'll set that up. Um, next week. Or if I have time today, I'll set up the slides for this, this trichomonas. It would be bonus. So you guys, trichomonas, is it a eukaryote or a prokaryote? Eukaryote, which domain? Eukaryote, eukaryote is it um, uh, involved in mutualism, commensalism, or parasitism? Parasitism. Um, in humans, how is it transmitted? Sexually. Sexually. Good. Okay. And then, folks, we'll go to the uh, next real common way that microbial pathogens, especially those that live and grow in the intestines, this is a real common way for intestinal pathogens to be transmitted. This is called fecal oral. And this makes sense, right, folks? If the pathogen is growing in the intestines, how will it be passed from our body? In our feces, right? And so as the name suggests, um, Fecal oral transmission is when we consume the uh, feces that has the pathogen in it. And you're like, okay, unless you're a little kid, you know, you're not going to go around eating feces, right? But the big problem we have, folks, is that feces, human feces, animal feces can contaminate what? Food and water, right? Yeah, and so worldwide, you guys, people having access to clean drinking water, meaning drinking water that's not contaminated with human or animal feces, that's a huge issue. Right? And so fecal contaminated food and water is a big cause of diarrheal disease worldwide. And you guys, what do we know about diarrhea in babies and little kids? That's a killer, right? Because they dehydrate so rapidly. Yeah. So we're going to, throughout the course, we'll be talking about lots and lots of pathogens that have fecal oral transmission. So here, you guys, we're going to focus on just two um, protozoal pathogens that are transmitted uh, fecal orally. So the first one, you guys... Oh, I'm sorry, before we go into that, um, fecal oral protozoa have two different stages, and one is called the cyst. One is called the cyst, and functionally, you guys, the cyst is like a bacterial endospore. Its job is to protect the protozoan when the protozoan is out in the environment outside of its host. So it's got a tough resistant um, cyst uh, surface that's resistant to drying, sunlight. Some of them are really resistant even to chlorine, which is disturbing, right? But their job is to protect the protozoan out in the harsh environment. And then you guys, when the cyst, and I'll just show it as a circle, because to me, most of them look like circles or ovals. So, so when the cyst is swallowed in fecal contaminated food or water, it's tough enough to survive passage through the stomach, right? So it's not destroyed in the stomach. And then it reaches the intestine. And then in the intestine, it's the equivalent of almost like hatching, right? So the process, you guys, it's hard for me to say. It's called, it, it exists. It exists. I don't know why I laugh about that, because I can't say, okay, it's going to exist releasing the delicate, metabolically active feeding dividing form, right? And this feeding dividing form, you guys, I'll just show it in red. This is the trophozoite. And this is the one that's going to grow in the intestines and cause harm, right? So the trophozoite is responsible for the clinical signs and symptoms. Okay, so we're going to say the trophozoite 
causes clinical signs and symptoms it will mention. So um, clinical signs, you guys, are things you can see, observe, measure. Symptoms are things we can't measure. Your patient has to tell you, oh, my abdomen hurts. Oh, I feel nauseated. Oh, I feel dizzy, right? Don't even worry about it, but people say, what's the difference there? Okay. And folks, on the lab exam, I always will put the trophozoites. And the reason is, to me, the cysts frequently look really similar. I mean, they look round or oval. And so for me, and obviously, you guys, I'm not an expert, but if you had a bunch of different protozoal cysts on a slide, I would find it so hard to tell the difference, right? But what's really cool, you guys, the trophozoites are all very distinct. They look really, really different. And therefore, I'll only put the trophozoites on the lab exam. But you guys, what's really important to know is this trophozoite is very delicate, right? It would be easily destroyed in your stomach acid. So if you have um, feces that contains trophozoites that contaminate food or water, if you were to consume those trophozoites, they're destroyed in your stomach. So can they cause infection? Can the, can the trophozoites cause infection if you swallow them? No, right? They're destroyed. So which stage, you guys, do we call the infectious stage, the stage that we swallow to become infected? The cyst, right? So it's the cyst that this is the um, resistant infectious form. And that would be fair, you guys, for me to ask you on the exam. In the intestinal protozoa, which is the infectious stage? It's the cyst. Good, good. Okay. And then, folks, the two, the two um, intestinal fecal pathogens that we're going to look at, one is, you could say, a cousin of um, amoeba proteus. This little guy is called entamoeba. Entamoeba. So we know it's an amoeba, so it's going to form what, you guys? It's a trophozoite. It's going to form those beautiful pseudopods, yeah? And then the um, specific epithet or species name is histolytica. And you guys, this gives you an idea of what kind of damage the trophozoites are going to cause in your intestine. Histo means tissue. What, is, what do you think lytica? What does that sound like? Lysis? Lysing, right? So these guys are tissue lysers. And let me grab the um, amoeba model, you guys, just so we can kind of give you an idea. So folks, if you consume um, fecal contaminated food or water that has the entamoeba histolytica um, cysts in it, they pass through the stomach, they enter the intestine, they exist and release the feeding, multiplying trophozoites. And what these little guys do, if, if we can pretend you guys my arm is the surface of your intestinal epithelial cells, right? The entamoeba histolytica, they latch onto the surface of your intestines and they release hydrolytic enzymes, digestive enzymes, onto the surface of your intestinal epithelial cells. What's that going to do to your intestinal epithelial cells? It's going to damage them, hydrolyze them, right? And thus, histolytica, tissue lysing. And indeed, you guys, these guys can perforate the intestine. They can travel throughout the body and the bloodstream. They often end up causing, like, abscesses in the liver, right? These guys are nasty. And because, you guys, they're often causing damage in the lower intestine, is your intestines going to start bleeding? Yeah. And is a consequence, because this is occurring lower in the intestinal tract, when your patient defecates, it will have bright red wet in it. Blood. It's a bloody dysentery, a bloody diarrhea. And indeed, you guys, and I know this is horrible because it's like the poor people, but I love it when, when food analogies are used. In a person that's severely infected, they say their feces looks like raspberry jam. Do you guys know what raspberries are? Bright red, right? And if you make jam of them, it's kind of bright red and kind of chunky, right? So that's what the patient feces looks like. And often it's very little... Um, waste material, it's like, it's blood and digested epithelial cells and leukocytes and, you know, of course, lots and lots of entamoeba histolytica. So the disease, folks, is called, is called amoebic dysentery. And again, this is really serious. 
And, and the key here, you guys, and I'll put it in red, is a bloody diarrhea or a bloody dysentery, right? Nothing else that we're going to have on our lab exam is going to cause a bloody diarrhea. Okay, so a, we'll say a bloody diarrhea or dysentery. And again, folks, the, um, the description is the feces will look like raspberry jam. And what I'll do, folks, next week, I thought, because a lot of the, um, or at least many of the microbes on the lab exam are pathogens, I thought what I'd do is try to bring in pictures of people um, suffering with that particular infectious disease. And I'll try to bring in photos of the raspberry jam feces. It's like once you see it, you'll never forget it. Yeah, it does. Yeah, be, yeah, and we'll see you guys that um, fecal contamination of food and water has been a major killer of people, especially little kids and babies, throughout history. Because for a long time, people didn't even know that fecal contamination was, spread, was spreading pathogens. Yeah. Um, in, in the history part, you guys, it was John Snow in London. There was a cholera outbreak in London. And cholera, you guys, is caused by a bacterium, Vibrio cholera. It causes a profuse watery diarrhea. It doesn't cause blood, but you dehydrate so rapidly from the Vibrio cholera. And so John Snow figured out, he didn't know exactly what was happening, but he knew it was water that people were getting from a particular pump on Broad Street, the Broad Street pump. He, he, he said, these people are getting cholera somehow from that water. So he took the handle off the, of the Broad Street pump. That was his intervention. And by doing that, then the number of cholera cases went down. So it turned out the water in that pump was being contaminated by feces of people that were suffering from cholera. So you're right, the, the um, fecal contamination of water historically is a big killer and it continues to be a big killer of folks that don't have access to good water. Yeah, it's a huge public health issue. Yeah, thank you. Okay, all right, you guys. So, um, so um, you guys, if, if let's say you know, you don't have a fancy clinic um, to send your samples to, and if you, you, a patient presents with this bloody raspberry jam diarrhea and you suspect amoebic dysentery, what sample would you ask for from the patient? Feces, right? Right, because where's the pathogen going to be that you, where you can see it? Is it the feces, right? So you guys, you're going to be looking at fecal smears. And folks, let me warn you ahead of time, fecal smears are tough. It's like a jungle trying to find the pathogen in feces. Why? There's, yeah, there's so much poo in there, right? And sometimes you're like, is this poo or is this a pathogen? Poo or pathogen? So with your fecal smears, you guys, in your prepared slides, a lot of your prepared slides, it's so hard to find the pathogen. So on the, um, on the fecal oral pathogens, you guys, I've set up demo scopes. Um, so on the first demoscope there, you guys, it's a trophozoite of Entamoeba histolytica. Remember, that's, that's the one I'll put on the lab exam, right? And um, so the trophozoites, you guys, again, if you're lucky when you see them, you know, usually they're round. And if you're lucky, you might see maybe like a single pseudopod, right? And the trophozoites in the demoscope, they're dark staining. I always look for a nice smooth outline, right? There shouldn't be any jagged edges if, it, if it's a cell. And another little tip, you guys, and don't even worry about this, but the nucleus tends to stain with a dark staining um, border or margin, and then there's a dark staining nucleolus in the center. And again, don't, don't stress about this, you guys, but it's just what I look for when I'm trying to find the little trophozoites. What will be the key on the lab exam is in the description of the specimen, I'm gonna say this is a fecal smear from a patient suffering from what kind of diarrhea? A bloody bright red raspberry jam diarrhea. And as soon as you see that, you know it's Entamoeba histolytica. And you guys, this is part of the lab practical strategy. Read the description of the specimen clearly. Your colleagues in the past said, I knew what it was without even looking at the microscope, just from the patient description, right? So again, you guys read the description of the sample carefully because there'll be lots of hints in there. You might just like right off the bat know what it is, or at least you can narrow it down to maybe two or three different microbes and then you look at the microscope or look at the photomicrograph and then you'll be able to nail it. Does that make sense, you guys? Okay, all right. And then folks, um, the second, um, 
pathogen, protozoal pathogen that's transmitted fecal orally. This is a big one here in California, you guys. It's called Giardia. And with Giardia, you guys, there's different um, species names, specific epithets. So we're just going to keep it to the genus name. So it's called Giardia. And again, it's fecal oral, folks. So what would be the infectious stage that we swallow to get infected? The cyst. And what is the stage that actually is going to cause the clinical signs and symptoms in our intestines? The trophozoite. And you guys, these trophozoites, to me, they're cute. I know I'm silly, right? But I love the trophozoites because they're teardrop shape, or they look like a little, a little leaf. And the trophozoites have two nuclei. And each, each of the um, nuclei, they have a nucleolus. And, and so you guys, if you get the trophozoite just right, it looks like it's looking up at you like, hello, like a Gary Larson cartoon. I just adore them. Okay, and then these little guys are flagellate. They have four pairs of flagella. They're often so thin, you guys, you won't see them. But sometimes um, you might see a little bundle of flagella towards the end here. But often, again, you can't see the flagella, you guys, but there's like four pair of flagella. And Giardia, you guys, don't cause tissue lysing in the intestine. So would you predict you're going to see a bloody diarrhea? Nope, right? But what they can do, I, I'm going to have to change models here. Okay, guys, let's just pretend this is my Giardia trophozoite. Here's the... Um, my intestinal mucosa. So what the Giardia do is they attach to the surface of your intestines. They have a sucker. They attach to the surface because they don't want to get pooped out, right? They want to live in the intestine where it's warm and moist and there's a lot of food. And what happens, you guys, if you have lots and lots of Giardia, they start multiplying and they start covering huge surface area of your intestines. And that can block absorption of water and nutrients. So in chronic infections with what's called giardiasis or beaver fever, and I'll explain what we mean by beaver fever. So this um, giardia, you guys, it causes the disease called giardiasis. And I'll put in parentheses, you guys, beaver fever. We'll come back to that. It causes what's called a malabsorption syndrome. And if your patients are infected for long periods of time, They'll have a wasting syndrome. You know, they're, they're losing weight. And historically, it was hard to diagnose because often the cysts and trophozoites are only shed intermittently. So you might take a fecal sample and you don't see anything, right? Um, so with GR, you guys, if you're trying to do diagnosis based on presence of cysts or trophozoites in the feces, you have to take multiple fecal samples, right? Okay. One of my friends from high school developed it. And they didn't diagnose it for a year. And I was shocked, you guys, when I saw her. She, she was just totally wasted away, right? Because she wasn't able to absorb nutrients. <clears throat> and for, furthermore, you guys, um, um, fats don't get absorbed. So fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, and K aren't getting absorbed. So, so on top of the malabsorption syndrome, you'll have um, vitamin deficiencies of A, D, E, and K. Classically, you guys, it's um, if if the feces right the feces it's it's feces gives good information, you guys. So we said that the feces won't be bloody, but they'll be fatty and foul smelling. And it will cause a diarrhea, right? Because you're not able to absorb. And again, we can end up with those um, um, fat soluble vitamin deficiency. One of your colleagues had it. She got it at summer camp. And I was like, oh, what a bummer you know, to get this at summer camp. And she said it was so painful. Her abdomen is so painful, right? With regard to um, um, transmission here in California, folks, figure all the natural fresh water in all of California is contaminated with giardia cysts. So all the creeks, all the rivers, all the streams, all the lakes. So if you go on picnic or go camping or backpacking, never drink fresh water here in California without treating it. Like boiling it is probably the best. Um, there's filters, water filters that can filter out the cysts. Um, there's chemical treatments. 
Um, but uh, that's a great way to get infected, you guys, is to drink water, fresh water here in California without treatment. Now, a lot of people think beavers are the reservoir host, so that's why it's often called beaver fever, right? Um, they had an outbreak in North Lake Tahoe, and they thought it was the beavers. But probably, you guys, my thought is it's more likely it might be that our waterways have been contaminated with human feces. So when people go out for picnics or hiking or camping, um, and there's no bathroom, right? So they might defecate just on top of the soil, and that's you shouldn't do that, you guys. If you need to defecate out in nature, you need to dig a hole, right, and then defecate in the hole and then cover it up, right? Because if you defecate on top of the soil, and let's say you are shedding Giardia cysts, when it rains, what will happen to the feces and the cysts? They run into the streams and creeks and rivers and lakes, right? Um, and, and furthermore, like up around Lake Tahoe, if it snows and the snow melts, the same thing will happen, right? So again, you guys, just figure all of our natural waterways here in California have some kind of fecal contamination. I always think of that when I see people sw swimming in the Sacramento River. I'm like, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, I mean, and it's so not, that's a real thing. yeah, no, and, 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 and I'll, I'll stop you guys, but this, the whole thing of feces is fascinating to me. So it's not only that people poop in the, um, you know, every, yeah, well, oh, I should say everybody, lots of people poop in the, the rivers and the lakes and what have you, the public swimming pools. If you go, my son came back when he was like, I don't know, a teenager, came home, he goes, mom, it was so gross. He dove down to the bottom of the pool, and there's a big turd there. <laughs> So anyway, like, people you know, poo, water. people <laughs> poo, right? And it's not just the homeless, you know, everybody yeah. poos. So, and, and, and I'll, I'll stop after this, you guys, but it makes me crazy um, because um, I used to volunteer at the UCD Arboretum and there's a big homeless population there and there's no public bathroom. And so I was like, push, and I go, we need a public bathroom, you know, because we're finding um, uh, human fecal deposits. And it is an issue, guys, because there was an outbreak amongst the homeless down in the San Diego area of hepatitis A virus, which is transmitted fecal orally. So you guys, I mean, it's just, it's, and I'll stop, but I'm just, this makes me so angry. It's just like part of human decency that folks that are homeless can have access to a bathroom, you know? It's like, if there's no bathroom, what are they supposed to do? And then, and then it makes me, I'll stop you guys, but you can see I'm just so angry about this. So I'm, you know, I called the city council and they're like, well, we'll refer you to the police department. And I'm like, you guys, this is a public health issue. If you don't care about the homeless, you know, you're protecting the, the public health. And so the argument is, made me so mad. Like members of the public say, it's not, some members of the public say, well, if we provide a bathroom, they're just gonna sleep in there. I'm like, come on, that's the most ridiculous argument I've ever heard. But this, anyway, you guys. Just makes me so angry from a public health point of view. I mean, if not from a human decency point of view, that doesn't matter if you're homeless or not. You should have a place to defecate and you should have a place to wash your hands. And for us not to supply that to me is absolutely inexcusable. Anyway, I'll stop. Sorry, you guys. <sighs> makes me so, so, okay. Okay. Oh, kidoki. So you guys, um, beaver fever, this was hilarious because a few years ago, one of your um, classmates was from Canada. And as a job, he led canoe trips. And so we were talking about Giardia. And he says in his great Canadian accent, I can't do it, you guys, but, oh, beaver fever, you know? So they'd go on these long canoe trips, right? And maybe they were drinking the water when they shouldn't have. And then the, can you imagine you guys developing Giardiasis on a canoe trip, you know, in your five days out in your canoe, it's like nasty. Anyway, anyway, so you go, we call it beaver fever. And again, you guys blaming the beavers, but probably a lot of it is from um, human fecal contamination. Okay, so again, you guys, um, the Giardia, oh my gosh, I had to hunt through three slides before I found a good trochozoite. So there is a demoscope there, you guys, with the Giardia trochozoite. You guys, on the fecal smears, absolutely for sure, we aren't going to use scopes on the lab exam. We'll use photomicrographs because, again, it's so hard to find them, and if somebody bumps the scope by accident. Anyway, so it, it will be a beautiful photomicrograph, 
and it will be classic presentation, you guys, with uh, Giardia, we'll do the big teardrop shape. You'll see the nuclei there. Um, and again, you get fatty, foul-smelling diarrhea. You're going to say who? Giardia. Um, bloody raspberry jam diarrhea. You're going to say, good job, you guys. You're becoming clinicians already. Okay, folks, so um, that's our fecal oral. We've done this. Okay, sexual we'll do next week. Fecal oral. And then, you guys, the last ones we'll do are going to be arthropod vector. So specifically, you guys, we're talking about blood-feeding insects or blood-feeding um, arachnids like ticks. Okay, And the, the three that we have for you here, folks, um, are transmitted by blood-feeding insects. All right, so the first one we'll do, you guys, what we'll do is we'll divide them according to their arthropod, arthropod host, um, their vector. No, excuse me. Arthropod host was wrong, you guys. We'll um, break them down according to their arthropod vector. And again, folks, knowing the arthropod vector is really important because if you're in an area where the arthropod vector doesn't live, you shouldn't have transmission, right, um, locally. But if the arthropod vector lives in your area, that means you can have local transmission, right? So that's why, again, you guys, going back to, like, you need to be an ecologist to understand... Um, infectious disease transmission, right? Okay, so the um, there's going to be three different pathogens, you guys, and they're going to have three different arthropod vectors, right? And folks, um, all three of these uh, pathogens have a stage when they're replicating in the blood. So what sample would you take from your patient to try to do like a microscopic diagnosis? Blood smears, right? So you guys, you're going to have, you're going to be looking at blood smears. So we're going to do blood smears, and these are a little bit easier to find, folks. Um, one of them is a little bit harder, but again, I have demo scope set up over on the the side. So the first one, you guys, the arthropod vector, is what's called um, a triatoma. That's a genus name, or the family name is Reduvid insects. And um, these are the vectors for the pathogen called Trypanosoma crucii. And the disease, that's a U, folks, sorry. Trypanosoma crucii. And Trypanosoma crucii, you guys, it causes the disease. Um, the fan, well, the fancy name for it is American trypanosomiasis because it's only found here in the Americas, North America, Central America, South America. So it's called American trypanosomiasis. And um, a common name for it, you guys, is called Chagas disease. And this is named in honor of Dr. Chagas, who was a Brazilian physician who finally figured out the natural cycle of how this horrible disease was being transmitted. So it's caused, also called Chagas disease in honor of um, Dr. Chagas. So the transmission, you guys, this is really interesting. And again, it's um, there's there's endemic areas, you guys, in Central America, South America. So if you go traveling, make sure if you find out if if they have American trypanosomiasis. These insects come out at night, right? The insects come out at night. They like to live in dark cracks, um, and usually these insects are often really abundant in homes that have been made out like mud or thatch. They love the dark little corners there. So they come out at night while you're asleep. And they're probably following the CO2 um, concentration gradient, right, because we're breathing out CO2. So they're crawling up where? Yeah, on the face, right? Mm -hmm. And then they have a piercing mouth part, like a hypodermic syringe, and they pierce your skin and then start sucking blood. And while they're sucking the blood, they defecate. And the parasite, you guys, is in their feces. It's fascinating. So, you know, maybe you feel a little tickle, right, on your face in your sleep. So you go, you know. So you wipe the feces into the bite wound. So you actually play a role in getting infected. Or, you guys, if they're up here around your eye, you feel a tickle, right, and you go like that. And so you wipe the feces into the eye, right? So, um... So what happens, you guys, is the parasites, they replicate and they spread. And in chronic infections, 
what will happen, chronic means long term, is they invade the cardiac muscle. So they invade the heart muscle, the cardiac muscle. And this is a big cause, you guys, I didn't know this, in some parts of the Americas, this is a huge cause of congestive heart failure. That's horrible. Right? Congestive heart failure. And furthermore, they can invade... They can invade the smooth muscle of the esophagus or colon, esophagus or colon, and as a result, um, the smooth muscle can no longer contract, so you can't swallow, and you end up with what's called mega esophagus, right? Oh, horrible. And if the colon, you can't. Um, contract the muscles for peristalsis, what happens to the feces? Just builds up, right? And you, you um, end up with megacolon. So this is nasty, you guys. This is really, really nasty. So um, the bad news is, you guys, we have um, vectors here in um, California, um, in the United States, that can act as vectors for Trypanosoma cruzii. And furthermore, you guys, it's been detected in donated blood, right? So, so we know, and it makes sense, you guys. We're Californians. We're from all over the world. We have family all over the world. We'd love to go traveling. So it makes sense. There's going to be people that have it. And the concern is, it, is if our native vectors get infected, then we can have local transmission, right? So they do, they do screen blood, you guys, because it has been found in donated blood here in California. So they do screen for trypanosoma cruzi now in donated blood, right? Because they want to make sure that, you know, they're not passing it through the donated blood. Yeah. What's that word next to trypanosoma? Oh, Reduvid. Sorry, you guys. This is a family name. R-E-D-U-V-I-I-D. -I -I it's a family of insects. And, and what makes it really challenging, you guys, is the vector. It has... There's several different names. You can call them reduvid bugs. You can call them triatoma is a specific example. You guys are also called kissing bugs. Why? It looks like they're up here near your mouth kissing you. They're also called assassin, assassin beetles, right? But you guys, to be scientifically correct, I would love for you to give me a genus name, right? If you, if you told me kissing bug, I'd probably give you, like, partial credit because I think it's good for us to learn the genus names, okay? You, you guys all right with that? All right, now you guys, the, um, the problem with doing diagnosis on a blood smear is often there's very few trypanosoma in the blood, right? Especially if they've invaded the heart and the, the smooth muscle. So they make a really thick blood smear, so all the blood cells are all piled up on top of one another. So you might have trouble, you guys, finding them in your thick blood smear. So again, I put a demo. Um, a demo blood smear and put the pointer on a little trypanosoma cruzii there. And there's a much nicer photomicrograph. So again, you guys, on the lab exam, I'm going to use a photomicrograph so I can actually point to the trypanosoma cruzii. They're really cool, folks. So this, this is so sweet. Angela, who I had in micro last semester, she gave this to me at the start of this semester. This is a little trypanosoma. It's like, okay, you guys, I'm a sucker for stuff microbes. Okay. So you guys, so they have uh, they're this beautiful kind of S-shaped body, and they are flagellates, and the flagellum is attached at one end, and it curves over the, um, the body of the cell, and then it extends out. But what's really neat, you guys, they've evolved, this is called an undulating membrane. It's almost like a sail. So when the flagellum is moving back and forth like that, the sail is moving back, back and forth, and it provides more propulsive force for them. Right? They can move faster, more efficiently through the blood um, with that undulating membrane. Yeah. Um, often, you guys, all, all you'll see in your blood smears is this little S-shaped guy. You might barely get a hint of the flagellum and undulate, uh, undulating membrane. Oh, but I know what I wanted to say. So, you guys, in the blood smears, like if these are the RBCs, right, the erythrocytes, in blood, the trypanosomes are outside of the red blood cells. You're going to see them is little extracellular guys. Right, these little delicate kind of, almost like little baby snakes, and they're outside of the red blood cells. And this, this will be important later 
And you guys, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm taking way too long. Okay, so you guys, so that's um, American trypanosomiasis caused by trypanosoma crucii. And um, trypanosoma crucii has a close relative called trypanosoma brucii. <laughs> So the vector here we're talking about, you guys, a blood-feeding fly called Glycina, or the common name is the tsetse fly. And this is the vector for the pathogen called Trypanosoma brucei. And Trypanosoma brucei causes the disease known as African trypanosomiasis. or um, sleeping sickness. And the reason is, um, once it's introduced through the bite of the tsetse fly, and when the um, tsetse fly bites us, it injects saliva that has an anticoagulant in it, maybe a little anesthetic. So in, um, with the, seat, with the um, tsetse fly, when they bite us, they inject the trypanosoma brucei, and it replicates in the body. It can, I just read, it can invade the heart, but what's kind of notorious, it invades the central nervous system and can induce kind of almost like this coma-like state in your patient. So it's like they're never quite awake, you know? It's like they're always a little bit almost ready to fall asleep, and that's why it's called sleeping sickness. And it can be fatal, right? So again, folks, this is important. If you're going to travel to Africa, make sure you, you, know, you find out if they have um, trypanosoma brucei present. Um, my my um, office mate, Ken Naganuma, he and his family went to Africa, and they they visited an area where they had the glycina. He said they're very aggressive. You know, they, they're they very aggressive. They come after you. Oh, and you guys, they have slashing mouth parts, like scissors, right? Right? So, again, you know, check it out before you go to, uh, when you go traveling, try to check out what kind of infectious diseases are there. They, too, you guys, they have the beautiful little um, S-shaped bodies. They're bigger. It seems to me, you guys, they're bigger than Trypanosoma cruzii, and certainly in our blood smears, they're so numerous. So these are easy to see in the blood smears. And again, folks, they're going to be extracellular. They aren't going to be in the blood. In the blood smears, they're not in, in the blood cells. So again, you'll see these beautiful little snake-like um, Trypanosoma outside of the red blood cells. Um, last one, you guys, and I'm running out of room here. I tried to set this up so the movie could catch the slide. So I'm going to tip this just a little bit so hopefully we can capture this last um, vector borne protozoal pathogen. And this is a really important one, you guys, worldwide. Okay, so the vector here is a special um, genus of mosquitoes called the Anopheles mosquitoes. So for full credit, you guys, I would like you to know that it's the Anopheles mosquitoes that transmit the protozoal pathogen called Plasmodium. And Plasmodium is the pathogen that causes a horrible disease called malaria. And you guys, malaria, um, there's different species, but one of the species, it's, it causes such high death rates in children and in pregnant women. And there's some terrible statistics, like every 30 seconds a child dies of malaria somewhere in the world. Now you guys, we used to be endemic for malaria. We had local transmission of malaria here in California and the United States, and it was only through uh, mosquito control um, and treatment of people that were infected that we're no, we no longer have local transmission. But you guys, here in Northern California, we have our own, it's called the Western Malaria mosquito, and it's named in honor of the entomologist from, I think he was down at UC Berkeley originally, um, Dr. Freebornai. So it's called Anopheles Freebornai. And um, Freeborn Hall over at UC Davis is named in his honor. So he did a lot of the work to um, um, identify the vector of malaria here in California. So you guys, if we have the Anopheles mosquitoes here, could we become endemic for malaria again in the future? Yes, yeah, we sure could, right? So again, really important if we know we have the vectors or not. So what happens, you guys, just in a nutshell, when the female, it's only the females, you guys, the mosquitoes, only females are the blood feeders, and we make all kinds of silly jokes about that. 
the males are actually really important pollinators in nature, but the females have to have a rich blood meal because they have to make all those eggs, right? So when the, um, the female Anopheles bites us, they inject some saliva, and that has the plasmodium in the saliva. And so the plasmodium first travels to our liver and replicates in the liver asexually. And then the plasmodium starts invading our red blood cells. So you guys, when you look at the blood smears from your patient that is suffering with plasmodium infection, are you going to see the plasmodium outside the red blood cells or are you going to see them inside the red blood cells? Inside, right? So that's a, that's a key, you guys, when you're looking at blood smears. You see the little trypanosoma outside? Okay, that's trypanosomiasis. But if you see the red blood cells themselves are infected, right, that's your plasmodium. So plasmodium is an intracellular parasite of your red blood cells. And, and furthermore, you guys, um, the plasmodium are replicating asexually in your red blood cells, depending on the species, every 48 to 72 hours. All the infected red blood cells break open, releasing you know hundreds and thousands of plasmodium. When the red blood cells break open, it releases toxins that trigger the classic malaria attack. So uh, fever production, you, know, you feel cold, you shake, right? And then um, eventually the fevers um, will be reduced. You're like, whew, I'm over that. But then in another 48, 72 hours, it's going to start all over again. So we talk about... Um, a fever every two to three days, that's kind of classic for somebody with malaria. So that would be an important um, part of the history of your patient. And again, you guys, travel history where your patient has lived will also be really important to see if they've lived or traveled to a malaria endemic area. Okay? Okay, you guys, so thank you so much. You've been so patient. Um, so again, you guys, um, Tuesday, the whole the whole time will, will be for protests and any other review you want to do. So, um, again, you guys, I wanted to get all the protests done today so you'd have the weekend, you know, to start organizing, start studying. And then next week, it can pretty much both labs be just time for you to review the units for the lab exam. Okay, so I'll, let me shut down our little movie here. And we'll get this posted on... We'll post it to YouTube and then we'll post it to our Canvas site.